good morning uh, to each one of you. Let's just join together with a little chorus while others are coming into our church building this morning. Almighty God, we give you praise for your Son, the Word of God, by whose power the world was made, by whose blood we are redeemed. And let's focus our attention on the wonderful person of Jesus Christ in this morning. for going to Calvary and dying in my place. My Jesus, I love thee. Let's sing this truthfully this morning as we stand together after the introduction. <coughs> Jesus is love. 
you have a copy of God's Word, you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. I'm commencing to read it at verse 9. And here the Lord has promised to give an everlasting joy, an everlasting peace to his children. And he has promised to hold us in times of desperate need. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength. O arm of the Lord, awake. As in the ancient days and the generations of old, art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Art thou not it which hath dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea away for the ransom to pass over? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. And come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of man that shall die, and of the Son of Man which shall be made as grass? And forgettest the Lord thy Maker that stretches forth the heavens, and laid the foundations of the earth, and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy, and where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hasteneth that he may be loosed, and he should not die in the pit, nor this his bread should feel. But I am the Lord thy God, that divided the sea whose waves roared, the Lord of hosts is his name. I have put my words in thy mouth, And I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the people and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, as we bow in your very heavenly presence this morning, we thank you that we come to a holy God, one who is righteous, one that is pure, and one that is indescribably holy holy. We thank you, Lord, that even the angels, they did not sing love, 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 but they sang holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, that our God is holy, he is holy, is, and he is completely and utterly holy. He is of two pure eyes to behold iniquity. And yet we thank you that many of us this morning are clothed in the garments of your salvation, You have clothed us in the garments of your divine righteousness. And we thank you, Lord, this morning that we may enter into your holy presence with unveiled faces and look upon our great God. And we say that there's no one like our God who this morning reminds us stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, the one who has put uh, his words in our mouths, the one this morning who covers us in the shadow of your hand, the one who's promised, who said that thou art my people. We praise you to be part of the inheritance of God, to be part of the children of your people. We thank you, Father, that we are your children whose names are carved upon your hands. And so we come this morning and we plead the blessing of God. We pray that you would come and presence yourself among us. Might we feel the burning sensation of the Spirit of God in our heart that the disciples could say, did our hearts not burn within us as we met with him? We pray that you would lift our minds. You know, many this morning has heavy burdens upon their thoughts, perhaps has been downhearted this week, has been depressed, perhaps some situation or some trial has just taken them over and they're stunned this morning, they're numb. Might they lift their eyes unto the God who is mighty in power, who can do exceedingly abundantly above all we're able to ask or think or imagine. Might we tap into the resources of our heavenly Father. Might we see that you said men ought always to pray and not to faint. We do ask you for those who are unable to join with us. We pray, Lord, for Heather Craney, We ask you that you'll continue to strengthen her. Might she feel a real touch in her body this morning. We do remember John and Elsie McElroy, faithful servants of the King of Kings. We think of Gwen Crooks, we think of Mrs. Weir, 
O Hawthorne and Annie Bailey remember Mrs. Keziah Hall, and for many others that are sick or needing a touch from you, might they find the shadow of God Almighty coming upon them and, and, and sustaining them. We do remember our missionaries today that are scattered throughout this world for Danny and Philip of Brooks serving you there in the Philippines and for the Park family, for Gemma Maxwell in Thailand and for Ben and Alice Weber, for Glenn and Prisca Charlton. We do plead your blessing to be upon them. You have told us that you are no man's debtor but that you will pour into the servants of God a blessing that should not be able to be contained. We do ask you for those that have experienced the devastation of earthquakes in Morocco, for the floods in Libya. Might your people on the ground be given strength and given the resources that they need, not only to meet their physical needs, but the spiritual needs of the Moroccan people even today. And for ourselves, for the children in Sunday school, for the parents who are bringing them up, might they be given wisdom and a skill uh, to know your word and to be mastered by your word. And so we do plead for ourselves that you would come and brood among us and help us to worship you correctly, even in the spirit and in the beauty of holiness. In your name we pray. Amen. We did begin last week to learn a new chorus, our new hymn, I Belong to the Lord. And we're going to try this again this morning. Tremendous words. Remind each young person here that they're special to God. They're made in God's image with a living soul. And uh, let's, this, this is what our generation needs to know, that we're loved and even appreciated by our Heavenly Father.
We do welcome each one of you this morning to the house of God and we appreciate that you've made the effort. It's a very uh, wet and even autumny day and we thank you just in the Saviour's name. Do you remember our pre-service prayer meeting this evening at 6pm just in our creation if you can join us as we generate prayer to God that the power of God might fall upon our services that we might see individuals come and trust him in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we long for, the fire of God to fall and to separate a new generation unto the name of Jesus. Then our praise service will be this evening with William Sayers and Sarah McElhaga coming along to bring ministry and song and there'll be special, a special children's slot and then a small epilogue afterwards and then there'll be supper for all. And so I want to encourage you to bring your friends and family, perhaps those who haven't been out recently at church, then send them a message, bring them along and let us come together to praise and to worship the name of our great God. And there will be, as I said, supper afterwards. If there's any men free after the service to just help set up the back hall, we would appreciate that. And if you just leave the petition as it is. Monday, tomorrow, Cookstown Independent Methodist Church will be at 8 p.m. We'll be holding a special seminar on parenting in a digital age. Many parents are questioning what to do uh, whenever their teenage uh, children and the internet and all of the dangers that's on it, what and how to handle it. And the care organization, which is similar vein as the Christian Institute, will be giving that presentation in Cookstown at 8 p.m. tomorrow. And you're very welcome to join the folks there. On Wednesday is our Bible study and prayer meeting at 8 p.m. And Friday is Lifeliners at 6.30 p.m. It was good to hear that around 60 boys and girls joined uh, the leaders on Friday. And there's these little leaflets, do take them, hand them out. And uh, even if you're in school, give them out to other uh, pupils. Then on Saturday, Quest recommences at 7.30 p.m. This is the leaflet that you want to take. And with Milo the Gospel Dog. And so Milo the Gospel Dog is a, it's a little Springer Spaniel. And it'll be along just to do some different uh, tricks and techniques that my dog certainly doesn't do. But your dog might do it. But Milo does all of these different uh, techniques and then... The, the owners will bring a gospel message through that. And so if you're age 10 to 14, then do come along on Saturday at 7.30 to 9 p.m. Sunday school and Bible class is at 10.30 a.m. This is the little leaflet that you want to take on the road out and hand it to any children that you think would be interested or parents in sending their children to Sunday school. And then the Sunday morning service is at 11.30 a.m. And then our Sunday evening service is at 6.30 p.m. Next Lord's Day evening, uh, I will be giving a word of testimony. Now, I feel a little bit like the Corrie Ten Boom who said, Lord, people have heard my testimony a thousand times. Why would they want to hear it again? And yet on my holidays, God burdened me to give my story again. And perhaps you know someone that has been involved in clubbing and drugs and drink, and you think they could come and hear what God can do in the life of a sinner I want you to invite them next Lord's Day evening to hear what God has done in my life. And uh, what he's done in mine, he can certainly do it in your families. There are some items on the, on the entrance into the church. And if, you, if, what you, if one of those belongs to you, do please take it or else uh, we will donate it to a good cause. Let's join together in a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, we bow and we thank you for your goodness to us. And we look at our fridges, we look at our, our homes. And we say, surely God has been good to us. He has opened his hand and he has satisfied us with every temporal blessing in Christ. And we just would hand back to you our tithes and our offerings. And we pray that you would take it and that you would extend them, even to the extension of your kingdom throughout this world. We thank you for the generosity of the people of this congregation to invest in a kingdom that will have no end. And Lord, you've told us that you're no man's debtor, that you will indeed repay us, not only here upon earth, but one day in heaven for our investment in the, king, in the kingdom of light. And we just would pray today, even that you would ask your blessing to those that perhaps are struggling financially or emotionally or spiritually, <laughs> Might you make up the deficit and might you encourage him this morning that while we're waiting, God is working 
even on our behalf. In your name we ask. Amen. Let's join together for our next hymn prayer. It is the soul's sincere desire uttered or unexpressed. And our subject this morning is prayer that brings revival down. Prayer that brings revival down. And prayer, of course, is a privilege of the Christian to come and storm the throne room of grace and have the attention of a God that has promised to hear and answer prayer. We'll stand together after the introduction and the opening verse the boys and girls can leave for Children's Church. chapter 18 and we'll just read a few verses we'll not be thinking on it this morning but just to lodge the Lord's uh, verse of words into our mind particularly verse 1 of chapter 18 Luke chapter 18 and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying there was a city 
a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. The Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, and he will come, shall he find faith on the earth. Then we'll just turn to our Bible reading this morning from 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. And this morning we continue our topic that we left off last Lord's Day, a contest for a nation. And more specifically this morning, prayer that brings the fire down. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood, and the stones and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. <clears throat> and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, and let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to Brook Kishon, and slew them there. And the Lord will bless the reading of his word. Now as we come back to First Kings chapter 18, we may remember that Elijah is Yahweh's man, God's man. And he is on Mount Carmel at peace and section of land that was considered the sacred place of the people's God called Baal. A challenge has been set and laid down to decide who is the true and the living God. And do you remember from chapter 18 verse 24, the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And since Baal was known as the Lord of fire, the people could say in verse 24, it is well spoken. And so now it is showdown time. The occultish prophets, they have constructed an altar. They have placed a cow on top. And we find them dancing. We find them jumping. We find them calling. But not even a whisper from the parlous God called Baal. And so now Elijah needed evidence that Baal was a non-existent imposter. That Baal had ears, but he could not hear that he had eyes, but he could not see, that Baal had arms, but he could not move. He needed the green light from Jehovah, that is, the eternal, self-existent one, to confirm that he would forgive the people and heal the land. He wanted the fire of God to fall, the light of a spiritual awakening to dawn, the beginning of of the year of the Lord. And of course this text, it resonates very closely to many of our hearts because we are living in spiritually dark days. We are in a moral free fall as a nation that is destroying the soul of the people. That is eradicating Christian foundations and principles from schools and from our laws and from our land and from our offices. And without a move of God, I believe there'll come a day that we wake up and find a Britain that we did not know. And therefore we found last week that Elijah fell. And we noted the preparation he made in verse 30. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down in verse 33. And he cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the altar. He gathered Israel's scattered stones. And set about rebuilding a place to meet with the living God. And Elijah was learning that that, that, that what learning that what opens God's ears is a life that is fully surrendered and placed on the altar where we can say, God, you've got the last piece. Not only the preparation that Elijah made, but secondly, 
the prayer that Elijah said. For whenever Elijah had finished praying, a spark left heaven and ignited a spiritual awakening in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell. This morning I wonder, are we thirsting for this revival fire? The gracious movement of the Holy Ghost. God let loose. His power made visible and his presence made notable among his people. A thirst for a sense of God that brings people of Magashul into a consciousness of their sinfulness as they are made to become aware of the righteousness and the holiness of the God that we serve. And this is what I'm anxious to get at this morning, that we're experiencing a prayer that brings the power of God down, a power let loose through the avenue of prayer. Now let's look this morning at what Elijah said. Let's read it again. In verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, This is Elijah's prayer. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. This prayer itself is brief. In comparison to Puritan prayers, it's nothing special. Yet, after Elijah prayed, God came. And so we have to ask ourselves, what was it about Elijah's prayer that unleashed a spiritual awakening that we find 10 to 20,000 people falling to the ground and saying in verse 39, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Well, the first observation (laughs) is Elijah's prayer was intentional. It was intentional. It was showdown on Mount Carmel. And Elijah is concerned that people would have a knowledge of who God is. Note the word in verse 36. Let it be known in verse 37 that this people might know. Elijah is dealing with a lack of knowledge in the people's minds. And he's saying that this generation might realize, that it might learn, that it might have the information, whatever means to have a knowledge of who God is. Is that not the cry of Hosea? He said in chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Or was that not the cry of Isaiah in chapter 5, verse 13? Therefore are my people gone into captivity because they have no knowledge of God. The point is this, that knowledge of God often, in many cases, precedes faith in God. Because of our understanding of who God is forms the basis of our belief. Put differently, knowledge can inform and influence us to have faith in God. Do you know our world has never had so much knowledge, medically, socially, scientifically, but perhaps never has British society and even schools and centers been so impoverished of the knowledge of who God is is. I remember in the faith mission, I had been up in uh, Dundee and we were doing a a children's meeting. One of those, uh, one of the evangelists was talking about sin. One of those children said, sorry teacher, do you not mean a SIM card for your phone? In 2014, the Christian Institute surveyed 2,000 families and found that one third didn't know that Christmas marks the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are facing an epidemic, a famine of the knowledge of God in the lives of people. And so here's Elijah and he's praying like Paul prayed in Ephesians 1 verse 17, that the Lord God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Oh, may we pray that God would impart the glorious knowledge of who he is into the walled minds of lost people. Now, who is it that Elijah prays to in verse 36? And he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Firstly, Lord God speaks of God's deity. He is and always has been the supernatural God, the maker of heaven and earth, the ruler of time and of the universe. 
Not only, secondly, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel speaks of God's decree, that he is the covenant God of Israel, that without Yahweh there would be no Israel, that he was the one who formed the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, an unconditional relationship that promised to bring a Savior through the line of Israel. And therefore, as this dark generation stood before Elijah, He's intentionally calling on his daily God to fulfill his covenant decree to do one thing. What is it? Let it be known, knowledge, that you are God in Israel. And I feel this is a vision that we need today. That we serve a covenant-keeping God who has made us promises of revival fire. Do you remember Isaiah 44 verse 3? <coughs> For I will pour waters on him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour the, my spirit, the knowledge of who I am, on thy seed and of thine offspring. During the time of the Lewis revival, there was a, an 84-year-old woman that would get alone with God. And this was her prayer. Remember, Father, how you spoke to me about, the, about those men in the village and you promised to save them. And then she added this, if you do not fulfill your covenant promise, how am I ever going to trust you again? But you promised to fulfill your word and that death, frustration, and barrenness will be made to flee before your presence. And this is what she said, oh God, take the field. And God took the field in loose, and God was let loose. And thousands of people were swept into the kingdom. Duncan Campbell once said, I believe it could happen again. At that moment that God finds a people that he can trust to pray his covenant promises. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, men are always to pray and not to faint. This is not the time to throw up our hands and to say, what will be, will be for Britain. But this is a time to pray and seek the face of God. Elijah's prayer was intentional, but I also find that Elijah's prayer was very interesting in verse 36. It says, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. Do you see the long suffering of God? That God hadn't left Israel. That he was still in Israel. And that is one of the most encouraging parts of this study that I have seen. That as the nation had scattered God's altars, they had severely deleted their knowledge of Yahweh. They had severed their ties with God's people. They wanted self, they wanted sin, they wanted Satan. Yet God was still in Israel. God hadn't given them over. And I stood in the study encouraged that even as we stand on the precipice of darkness, we still have a God who's made us this promise of 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, that God will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That Ezekiel 33 verse 1 says, God has no pleasure in the wickedness. That's why we read at the end of verse 37, that thou hast turned their hearts back again. That God was giving these people another chance of repentance. Do you see this morning, Psalm 103, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. God is still in Ulster. God is still in Magashon. And oh, friends, may God count on us. May God count on us to pray, to see the lost saved, to see the church satisfied, to be in such a relationship as Robert Murray McShane, who said this, I seem to know the Lord Jesus Christ better than any of my earthly relatives. 
And perhaps there was no one who understood the mercy and might of God better than Daniel, who was living in a pagan Babylonian world. And such was the heaviness of his nation's sins that we read in Daniel chapter 9. He said this, I have set my face unto the Lord to seek by supplication and thanksgiving with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord God and made confession and said, O Lord God, the great and dreadful God that keepeth the covenant and mercy to them that love you. Was that not also the life of John Smith? John Smith was a blacksmith. His wife would often see him coming down the stairs after spending hours in prayer with his eyes swollen from crying, and he would come down and say to his wife, I am a broken-hearted man, not for myself, but on the account for others. The living God has given me such a sight of the value of precious souls that I cannot live if souls are not saved. And he would say to his wife, oh, give me souls or I die. Writing of John Smith, one writer said, I believe that when he stormed heaven, that angels and archangels were gazing over the battlesmiths at that poor blacksmith who dared to believe that God was a covenant-keeping God. My God is still in Ulster. And he wants just one man or one woman in this church that he can channel his power through an agent. Are you that person this morning? Elijah's prayer was intentional Elijah's prayer, I find, was interesting, but I find that Elijah's prayer tells us he was in touch with God. He was in touch with God. In verse 36, and that I am thy servant. I am here for you, God. I am your agent, and I have done all these things at thy word. We have to ask ourselves, what things? What was it that God had asked Elijah to do that he was obedient to? To follow, well, you may remember from previous chapters, chapter 17, that under God's direction, Elijah, he had marched into the royal palace and court of Ahab, that wicked king. He had told him about the idolatry and wickedness of the kingdom. He had prophesied a severe drought in the land. He had told Ahab, he had pointed his bony finger at Ahab and said, it's your sins and the sins of the nation are to blame. During the drought, God had instructed Elijah to hide by the brook Cherith. While staying with the widow of Zarephath, her son fell ill, and Elijah prayed to God, and the son was restored to life. And after Elijah could say all his actions up to this point were in obedience to God's command, he was a man who was walking in line and in step with the word of God. And therefore, when there is an obedient heart, you will always have the ear of God. Is that not what the Lord Jesus Christ said? In John chapter 15, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will and it shall be done. Is that not the basis of James chapter 5, verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Oh, Elijah's life reminds us this truth, that no amount of activity in the king's service will compensate for neglect of the king's word. And is that not what we see today? How many professing Christians profess to know God, to follow God, to love God, yet are slow to walk in obedience to God's word. They have never been mastered. They are still in the milk of the word and not in the meat of the word. There is many today that is on the shelf of of their spiritual experience because they have lost the awareness of God in their life through disobedience. Is that you this morning? We cannot live wrong. And pray right. God has said, if we regard iniquity and sin in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us. Can you say, I have done all these things at your word? The Holy Spirit is at home in my heart. And I am convinced of this truth that God can solve the need if in Dungannon. 
if he can get this full congregation to walk in obedience to his word, to be in a place where God can speak to each one here, no matter what age, and a place where he can channel his Holy Ghost power through you. John Wesley said this, give me 100 people, and there's more than 100 people here this morning, who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen, they alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven upon earth. Duncan Campbell said this, where man is rightly related to God, there is a correspondence fixed with heaven and the presence of God becomes a supreme reality in his soul and in his community. Notice with me another aspect of Elijah's prayer. It was intense in verse 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art God, the Lord God. Here we find Elijah, a man who is intimate with God and not intimidated by Ahab. A person with a holy fear that is bowing before the presence of a holy God. He is bent before the hand of God. And with an earnest, dramatic cry like Jacob, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. My James reminds us of this very fact of hear me, hear me, of James 5 verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to like passions of us. Elijah was like us. But he prayed earnestly, fervently, that it might not rain and it rained not upon the earth by the space of three years and six months. Do you see Elijah's reputation? Hear me, O Lord, hear me. This underscores the urgency of the hour, the intensity of his prayer. He's emphasizing his desire for God to come and to manifest his power and to affirm his identity as the one and the true God of Israel. Is that not what we find in Acts 12 verse 5? When the Christians were holding a prayer meeting, seeking God for the release of Peter, we read in Acts 12 verse 5, but prayer was made without ceasing. Hear me, O God, hear me of the church unto God for him. The Greek word ceasing is never used in that sense anywhere else in the New Testament. Ari Tori said, it represents the soul stretched out in intensity of its earnestness toward God. Oh, hear me. When was the last time you got alone with God? An intensity and urgency prayed, oh God, hear me. Oh God, move. Oh God, you must come and you must come this very hour. This was evident in the life of Hezekiah when Sennacherib had come to the city of Jerusalem. Darkness looked like it was going to wipe God's people from the face of the earth. We find Hezekiah in Isaiah 37 verse 17 who said, O Lord, hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see. Why we need to get back to lingering with God in prayer. Not a five minute dash. But I hear me, O God, O Lord. When I was growing up in our church in Cookstown, I used to love listening to, to some really godly men in that church pray. And they used to pray this, O God, we need to pray through. We need to pray through. A sentence that is rarely spoken of, and as I a young fella, fresh off the boat, as it were, into the Christian faith, I always took that to mean as not a quick prayer, but a sustained, continuous effort in seeking God's presence and power for some specific matter, a prolonged period of prayer until the breakthrough comes. And yet the tension comes with our lives that the devil is us chasing our tail. I believe that Elijah's life reminds us that the revival fire will not come down with casual visits to God. You see, you ask how, before Elijah had learned about the public prayer that brings the fire down, he had learned the secret of private prayer. 
He had spent three isolated years at Brook Cherith where God taught him some amazing truths about the power and miracles of God. And had he not learned to pray privately, then his public victory in Mount Carmel might never have happened. And I wonder where we're at this morning in our prayer life. Are we a wrestler? Hear me, O God. Are we a clinger? O God. Are we an intercessor? Lord, you must come. Are you a fighter? I will not let you go until you bless me. Are we an an agonizer? If so, you understand the privilege. Because of the precious blood of Christ, we have access into the holies of holies that we can storm the throne room of grace for revival. By this morning, if you understand that, you know that you've got the ear of God because of the blood of Christ. That when we, have, when we pray, we have the assurance of 1 John 5, verse 14, that this is the confidence that we have. If we ask anything according to his word, he heareth us. And history teaches us, not, not only scripture, but history, that whenever God is going to revive his people, he moves a remnant to intercede and pray. We find in Ezekiel 22 that he sought for a man to stand in the gap to make up the wall of intercessors. The enemy was penetrated on every side and God was looking for one person who would take him at his word, but he found none. He couldn't find a wrestler. He couldn't find a clinger, an intercessor, a fighter, but can God count on you? As the siren of Satan's voice gets progressively louder, are you God's go-to person to pray? Now, when Elijah fell and finished giving intentional, interest and touch and intense prayer, we read now in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell. I want to say two things. The fire fell in abundance. Can you imagine the heat that absorbed everything, not just the sacrifice and the, and the wood, but as those false prophets looked on, they saw the stones, the dust, the water absorbed in this inferno heat. And we have to ask ourselves, what does the fire of God symbolize? Well, in Scripture, fire is a symbol of God's purity. When Moses uh, was given the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, the law that was a reflection of God's own holy being, we find in Exodus 19, verse 18, the Lord descended upon it by fire. And that fire couldn't be worked up. It had to come down. And we ask, why fire? Well, it was to show that God was holy through and through. And he wanted the nation to know that they have sinned against him. That they would be aware of the purity and holiness of God. Is that not what we long for? For we live in a nation that is polluted. That hasn't the faintest conception of the holiness of God. People just roll God's, God's, uh, God's name off their tongues as a curse word. People laugh when you say God is holy. Yet Duncan Campbell recalls that when the community was in the grips of God at the height height of Lewis, he says this, there was an awareness of the holiness of God that heightened a sensitivity to sin. I was reading again about it this week, and I love the the, the history of Lewis. Duncan Duncan said as he walked along the road, he would find a half dozen of ladies kneeling by the side of the road, crying conscious of their sinfulness. They were undone in their sin in light of the holiness of God. He said you would find buses stopped by the side of the road and the bus driver would be lying over the wheel crying to God for a mercy. On one occasion he found a a farmer at the end of his plow and the tears were just streaming down his face and he's saying, is there mercy for me, God? Is there mercy for me? Is this not what we want? Is this not what we need? A fear of God to grip Mogashal as they bow in the presence of a holy, thrice holy God. First, the fire fell in abundance. Secondly, it fell on the altar. It did not fall on the people. It fell on the sacrifice. Of course, here, this is a message 
the gospel message of substitution, where the fire fell. For the people's sin demanded judgment, and fire speaks of this judgment, but the sacrifice took the judgment. So sinners did not have to suffer for it. And surely this is a picture of Christ and his great substitutionary work for you, that, that the judgment did not fall on the soldiers as they nailed him to the cross, or to the people who taunted him to come down, but it fell on the Son of God and not the people, so that there was room for the people to be saved. That the Son of God absorbed the wrath of the people of Magashal. And praise God, that is why we can pray that the fire might still fall because of this truth. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And if the fire falls today, sinners still can plunge beneath that flood and still can lose all their guilty stain. I close with this. In 1914, at the brink of World War I, there was a great and godly man who was a foreign minister of the British Empire. His name was Lord Grey. And in the session of the cabinet that extended all night long, it was decided to go to war against Germany. And in the early hours of the morning, just as it was beginning to dawn, Lord Grey walked out of the foreign office with one of his cabinet officers and he stood on the steps. And as he looked down the street, he saw a lamplighter putting out the gas lights as he walked down the street. And Lord Grey looked to his companion and said this, See, the lights are going out. And then he added, The lights are going out all over Europe. Elijah knew the spiritual light, for God was dim, that the knowledge of the Holy One was diminishing. And the only solution was that God might come down in fire, which was, to bring a consciousness of the people's sinfulness. That they are made to become aware of the righteousness and the holiness of God. That is revival. That is what we desperately need. The Pentecostal fire that is still lit in heaven to fall. And so the challenge we face is will you be God's Elijah? Will you be God's agent? Will you be God's channel with a burden that you will prepare your altar, that you will pray earnestly and fervently for your friends and family? For when God sees the sacrifice, he will send the fire. And I believe that with all of my heart. 2 Chronicles 7.14 If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Are you that person? My today, how true the words of Hebrews 11, 28, verse 29. Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is still a consuming fire. Might the Lord burn those words onto our hearts. We're going to join together for our closing hymn of prayer. This hymn was, was written very much with Acts 2 in mind. Whenever God's people, the disciples, met together in unity, with oneness of mind, seeking God to come, and then the fire of the Lord descended. And so let's sing this, uh, this lovely hymn through. Let's stand together as we worship. They were gathered in the upper chamber as commanded by the risen Lord. And the 
Father, we pray this morning that you would fall, that the fire of God would fall as people become aware of their own conscience, of their own sinfulness, as a community is gripped with a sense of the holiness of God. Father, unless you come, we say like that man, Lord Grace, so many years ago, the lights are going out all over Europe. And we ask you, Father, that by your Spirit that you would revive this nation in the midst of years. We thank you we can claim the covenant promise that you will build your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But might we be a place, might we be God's agent, might we be God's go-to person, that he can lay a burden upon our shoulders to pray that God would come. So will we pray that your blessing would rest upon every family and might they understand for their concerns that prayer is the answer and that through prayer they will see the glory of God come and even their situation changed for time and for all eternity. In your precious name we ask. Amen.